Morning, everybody. Well, it's happening again. Another terrorist attack in a major European city. This time, it's Barcelona in the Catalan province of Spain. What do we know? Well, we know that a van at high speed ploughed into a crowd in the Las Ramblas area, a very upmarket, shopping, touristy-type part of Barcelona. I've certainly been there. It's a lovely place to go. At least it was until this afternoon. Uh, the last reports we've heard is that one person was killed, 32 injured, at least 10 of them seriously. There's also talk um, of a hostage situation taking place inside a Turkish restaurant. But let's cross immediately to Tim John, LBC's reporter in Barcelona. Tim, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Um, the latest from me here really is that the police are still going door to door uh, within the cordon. There is a huge cordon here all around the Ramblas. A lot of the streets around it uh, are currently shut on lockdown. Uh, they're going door to door, uh, checking these restaurants, uh, tapas bars, shops, um, and, and really looking to see if any of the suspects, any of the people they're looking for in connection with, with this attack, uh, are holed up in there. Uh, the reason they're doing that is because many of the people, and as you said, it's, it's a busy part of Barcelona. Yeah. Hundreds of people would have been there. Uh, many people ran for cover. They were either in the restaurants or the shops already, or they darted for cover uh, in those buildings, and the owners, managers put the shutters down and, and, and wouldn't let anyone leave. So... Um, so that's kind of what's happening here at the moment. You can hear sirens in the background. That's because there are police cars, both marked and unmarked, arriving on the scene. If I just look down towards the Ramblers, and I'm quite far away now because they extended the cordon quite rapidly here. Um, all I can see really is a sea of blue lights and, and police tape. So the cordon, Tim, means that nobody can leave that area or come into that area? Well, the people who are being allowed to leave are being escorted. Now, at the police cordon, certainly the one that I'm at, there are a few people standing in front you know, they're, they're, they're clutching tissues. They're bracing themselves for the worst here this evening. Uh, they're desperate for some news. There are a couple of people who've got cars and mopeds uh, kind of parked, uh, parked there, and I'm sure are desperate to get home after a day's work. But yeah. you know, they're frustrated, but they have to understand, as the police are telling them, uh, they're going nowhere for the moment. And Tim, uh, the... So the yeah, no, no one's in, no one's out. So the driver of the van that ploughed into the crowd, causing dozens of injuries and at least one death, he fled, I believe. We, what we heard was that he fled the scene and the police obviously then started a fairly intense manhunt to try and find that suspect. Uh, there are conflicting reports uh, that I've just been hearing in the past few minutes that, uh, uh, from, from various broadcasters here that that suspect has been found somewhere, but that's, that's not confirmed at the moment. It is quite, uh, quite difficult. It's quite a slow process to get that information out. But, I mean, we saw this, of course, in, in uh, Westminster, in Manchester, and at London Bridge just a few months ago. The police are cautious with stuff like this. They yes. don't want to put misinformation out there. So, yes. and you know, and, uh, uh, yeah. Tim, one last question. Um, is it yeah. true? Is it true? Do you know? Is there a siege situation, hostage situation taking place in a restaurant? I don't know for sure. No, we're just hearing lots of reports about it. Yes. Um, but obviously this is a big area. Lots of cordons. Others who are reporting that may be able to see that. I certainly can't. Tim, thank you very much. We'll be back to you very shortly. So politicians in the UK have started to give their reactions, and with me is Theo Ashwood, LBC's political editor. Theo, good evening. Yes, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, has uh, just released a very short statement to say that her thoughts are with the victim uh, of this terrible attack in Barcelona. She's added, the UK stands with Spain against uh, terror. Meanwhile, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, has also, uh, he's tweeted, in fact, terrible reports from Barcelona. My thoughts are with those killed and injured and the emergency services working uh, to save lives. Uh, the leader of uh, the, the SNP, the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, earlier, a short message from her, my thoughts are with everyone affected uh, by this horrific and mindless attack in Barcelona. I'm sure we're going to be hearing more from the main uh, politicians uh, throughout this evening and into tomorrow. Theo, thank you. Don't go too far away. Any more reaction, please let us know. Well, yes, my thoughts are with the victims, uh, with their families, and for Barcelona, which is a fabulous place uh, to go to. Uh, but every time this happens, we get, of course, the same reactions. We get, you know, the Prime Minister and the Mayor of London and the Leader of the Opposition and everybody uh, saying how horrible it is and how we're united and we stand together with, in solidarity with whether it's Belgium, whether it's France, whether it's Spain. Uh, but nobody, nobody seems to have really... Any answers? And I'm interested to ask you, you know, what can we do 
to protect ourselves. And I mean that not just at a national level, I mean it at an individual level too. I mean, has it reached the point where if you're walking along a busy street in a major city in Europe, that somewhere in your mind is that it might be a threat? Or do you just say, actually, in percentage terms, I'm probably still just about more likely to be struck by lightning? But, you know, the use of vehicles as weapons has been increasingly used. You know, remember Bastille Day, 2016, that lorry driving along in Nice, killing 86 people. Remember Christmas, 2016, uh, Christmas market in Berlin, 12 people killed when a lorry drove into a crowd. And this year, of course, you know, we remember um, Khalid Massoud, um, who hired a car and drove over Westminster Bridge, and in total, six people died in that attack. Um, and then, you know, eight people were killed in central London after attackers drove a van into pedestrians on London Bridge and then went into Borough Market. And, of course, uh, there was one where a man drove at a group of worshippers outside a mosque in North London, and one man died there too. So the use of vehicles uh, to attack uh, pedestrians, to attack innocent people, is clearly an increasing feature. What can we do? to protect ourselves from this or anything else. I want your thoughts on this, please. On 0345 6060 973, you can text me at 84850. You can, of course, tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC, and you can watch us live on Facebook from here in London, and we'll be getting regular reports live from Barcelona as any news develops over the course of the next hour. Uh, and my first caller this evening, who's got some ideas for us, I hope, is Rav from Leicester. Rav, good evening. Oh, Nigel, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thank you. So what what do we do? I mean, I, I made the point sure. a moment ago that, that every time... That, I mean, I go to the European Parliament and once a month it's in session in Strasbourg. And it seems yes. almost every month now at the start, uh, when the President of the Parliament calls us to order, you know, we stand for a minute's silence... Uh, and we say, and we say, we stand in solidarity with the victims. Absolutely. But nobody ever seems to be saying, "Hey, do you know what? We need to be doing something." Yes. And I would just like to make um, a wider point on this, and it's probably an angle which many p people probably don't like to mention. But I think we're getting at a point where where society is. So, I mean, without being labelled um, as a prime minister or anything along them lines, and I'm actually Asian, so I can't be. Um, right. But it's like the labels we we get placed by by society and the left. So. I think we do need to talk about the Islamic problem that we have in the UK, and it's a wider point. So if you look at everything that's going on, so whether it's from suicide bombers to child grooming gangs to female mutilations to honour killings, all these events and all these, all these kind of horrible, terrible things are happening disproportionately. Uh, and it's important to use that disproportionately. Uh, so not all, but disproportionately from, from a population which is Muslim from over 3%. And I think the issue we have is, like I was saying, we've... We've, we've got into a situation where what the left have done is they've designed a mechanism in such a way where if we were to say anything or to, to basically mention facts, because it's, I don't believe, and I think a lot of people who, 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 who live in the UK don't believe, we are racist, we are homosexual, or, or, or anything along the points, but we're just talking about facts. But we don't seem to be able to be able to speak facts anymore. So everything we've said today or I've said today is not, it's not fiction. It's not made up. These are facts. But Rev, we don't Rev like can I ask you, facts. Rev, can I ask you, what's your religion? Do you, do you practice? I'm Hindu. I'm Hindu. You're I'm Hindu. Hindu. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, and, and, and it is fair to say, is it not, that traditionally, over quite a long time, there's been a huge tension between the Hindu community and the Muslim community. Yes, yes there has been. Um, but again, I think there are a lot of good Muslim um, um, people out there. And I'd just like to make this point, which, which is where the differential will come into. And I won't take too much of your time, but I think it's quite important. So, like I would like to say openly, I mean, I've got tremendous loads of, my, of Muslim friends and they're decent yep. people. Yep. However, the important thing to clarify is, is as follows. So what most of the Muslims in the UK and a lot of people I talk to, so I'm not going to label everything or everyone, they are, they are classified as liberal Muslims. So by this, what I mean is that they don't follow Islam to the letter. They don't, a lot of them haven't read the Quran, um, but hmm. they are classified as Muslim, a bit in a way like Christians, Hindu, myself, or other people, we, we, we believe a faith, we believe what it is, but we yeah. don't follow things religious to the letter. So that's the first point. However, what we do have to understand is a lot of a lot of terrorism and terrorists and so forth that that, that, that do these terrible crimes 
actually do specify that we're Islam and it comes from the Quran and we did but we are in a situation where we're shutting that down so you now, need, that, Re- Rev you believe and, and and I'm pleased to hear you saying that you don't want to have a holy war against Islam because I think if we were to go down no, that route I think we'd lose I think it would be a catastrophe but you think we need to have a more open and honest debate that disproportionately some bad things are coming from one community yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to say that because we don't want um, any kind of civil war. And okay. like that. I know it's quite, quite big to say that. But what I was trying to make, the point I was trying to make was yep. we do need to have an open conversation because yep. no. at the moment we are whichever champion, we have been shut down. There's no channel to discuss these things. And there are items and there are various, various verses um, that are mentioned which actually do, do derive hate. Um, and I won't go into too much no, further, let's, let, let, let's not get too theological, Rav, at this moment in time. Um, but I thank you for the general point that you've made. Um, Rav, they're slightly making an assumption that this is an uh, extreme Islamic attack. Uh, it looks like the patterns we've seen in the past, but we don't actually know. And, of course, Spain has its own history of terrorism. Uh, the Catalan separatists, although it would be, I would have thought, very unlikely... Uh, that an attack from Catalan separatists would happen actually in the capital of Catalonia. Uh, But we don't yet know the full truth. Uh, Donald Trump um, has pronounced, he said, the United States condemns the terror attack in Barcelona, Spain, and will do whatever is necessary to help. Be tough and strong. We love you. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.15. Another terror attack using a vehicle, this time a van that is driven at high speed into a crowd of people into the Las Ramblas district of Barcelona. We know that one person is dead. We know 32 are injured, at least 10 of them seriously. And there are stories not fully confirmed that there may well be also a hostage situation going on inside a restaurant in Barcelona. Well, I'm, I'm saddened, but not surprised. By these attacks, I'm afraid, and as we, I have to be honest and say, we don't know yet what the source of it is, uh, but there has been a pattern, a steady pattern of these attacks, and we've seen them in France, we've seen it in Germany, and indeed we've seen it here in the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm putting it to, to you tonight that our politicians seem to have very few answers. I'm wondering what you think we can do to protect ourselves. David says to me by text, he says, Nigel, it may be wise to erect reinforced bollards along each side of the roads to allow pedestrians some protection. It's a radical move, but may help provide a deterrent from those barbaric, cowardly attacks. Well, David, one of the big arguments uh, that I've had over the course of the last few years is with political leaders saying, but Nigel, we need to build bridges, not walls. They've said it to me time and time again when I've argued for being very, very cautious about who we allow into our country. Well, David, your suggestion to some extent has happened already because on three London's bridges, on three of those bridges, we have built walls. Yes, <laughs> we're building walls on bridges. We've done it um, on, on, on three of the busiest bridges in London. And if you see them today, there are huge concrete bollards either side. And David says we should do this everywhere. I wonder, David, at what cost that would be? And that is a very real question and a practical question. Uh, on Twitter, Andy is very negative. He says we can't do anything, Nigel. We've entered into a war with terrorists. We have lost just like we did with the IRA. Andy, who appears to be throwing his hands up, and same as nothing we can do. Uh, Breaking, Catalan police say no one is being held up inside a bar by armed individuals in Barcelona, contrary to reports from local media. And that was our source for that, local Spanish media telling us there was a hostage situation. That is not the case. So it looks now like it's just one incident we're dealing with here. It's a van. It's being driven at high speed. Uh, Somebody estimated as fast as 100 kilometres an hour, 60 miles per hour, that ploughed into a crowd and a driver who then fled on foot. And we don't yet know whether he's been accosted or not. What we do know is a very large cordon has been put around the Las Ramblas area in Barcelona. What can we do to protect ourselves? Do we as individuals perhaps say to ourselves, I don't know, I'm not so happy visiting this city or I'm worried about going to London or do we just have to shrug that off and get on with life as normal? And I'd love to think we could get on with life as normal. But, you know, even here in London, the capital city of this country, we've now reduced the numbers of days that we do changing of the guard 
outside Buckingham Palace, and they now have a full armed escort with them. So it's all well and good saying we mustn't allow terrorism to change our way of life. To some extent, it is already. And any of you uh, that are going abroad this year uh, through uh, Britain's airports or airports anywhere know that we have to strip off now and take virtually everything off, don't we? Our shoes, our watches, cufflinks if we're wearing them. So our way of life is being changed, but what can we do to make ourselves a little bit safer? Stuart in Carmarthen is my next caller. Stuart, good evening. Nigel, good to speak to you. So what would you do, Stuart? OK, so, Nigel, first of all, it wouldn't happen um, imminently, but I think when manufacturers of vehicles um, are bringing out new cars and vans, they need to um, utilise the GPS system and create a system so it'll prevent cars from going anywhere where they shouldn't be, so built-up areas, off-road, and that would eliminate potentially this sort of incident and hmm. also I'm if not... anyone was taken ill at the wheel possibly i'm not um... convinced i'm not convinced Stuart, that if you're driving at 60 miles per hour down a road and you then go off it by you know a few feet onto a pavement that any system could stop the car doing that um it, it depends obviously you wouldn't be able to totally eliminate it but i think um if the gps system would control the car so it adheres to the speed limit, for instance, 20 miles an hour in a 20 mile an hour zone, hmm. not going to be able to get to 60 um, miles an Well, hour. if we it's finish it's up, big. if we finish up, Stuart, as some suggest, with driverless cars, uh, namely that it's all done by a computer, then I suppose you would finish up with cars that went at th maximum 30 or 20 or whatever it may be. So we may, in a way... Having thought it through for a second, we may, in a way, be heading in that direction. Uh, but I suspect that this is a very long way in the future, as you conceded at the start. Uh, I just worry short term. What on earth can we do? Short term, it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult situation to 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 get any precautions or to put anything in place as well. I think there needs to be more armed police. I think all the police officers should be armed. Well, in this country. Do you know that's, what, Stuart? That's my personal opinion. Do you know what, Stuart? Your second point there, um, I'm, now gonna, I'm now not going to argue the ins and outs of with you because I am absolutely convinced after what happened on London Bridge, I'm absolutely convinced that if that police officer had been armed, not even necessarily with a gun, but at least with a taser, those three bad guys would have been taken down there and then. As it was, he went up to them, didn't he? You know, with a bat on, did his best, but it just simply couldn't be good enough. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. OK, news coming out now. Casalan police now confirm that actually the number is 13 killed. That's up from one earlier. 13 killed. That's what the Catalan police are telling us. 32 injured, 10 of them very seriously. Uh, the Catalan police say no one is being held up inside a bar. I repeat that. So it is a one-off incident, but the number of dead has now risen to 13. So it is yet another horrendous attack. Stuart on Facebook says, has anyone claimed it was a lone wolf with mental health problems? No one, Stuart, has claimed anything yet about who it may have been. I will speculate on one thing. Uh, the number of injured now has gone up to 50. 13 killed, 50 injured. They're the latest figures we've got from the Catalan police. The only speculation I will make is I'd be very surprised if the person that drove this van wasn't a regular, habitual drug user. Uh, and I say that, and I've... So one or two people have a sharp intake of breath, but time and again we see with these incidents that it's young males, and, and, and very often... Yes, they've picked up an extremist ideology. There nearly always seems to be a link with drugs. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Kuram from Slough. Good evening. Hi, good evening, Nigel. Um, first of all, before I get to my point, I just want to give my condolences and also my prayers are with the victims and their families um, uh, of Barcelona, what's happened tonight in Barcelona. Yes, and um, we will share that. Second thing, actually, Nigel, you shocked me today, all right? In a good way, not in a bad way, you know, in a good way. And I want to say thank you because, you know, at the beginning of your show, when you started with all listing the um, uh, attacks that have gone on 
in the last year or so. Yes. I really believed you were going to miss the attack that happened at Frinsby Mosque, Park Mosque. Why? And you didn't. Why did you know. believe that? I don't know. I, I'm not you're much st- of a fan of yours. It sounds honest. like you're very prejudiced against me, doesn't it? But anyway. No, no it's not. I'm, I'm not prejudiced against anyone. I, I listen to what people say, and I make an opinion on that. Like today, I've called in and I'm putting my hands up. You've yeah, me. sure. Okay. You know. All right, thank and, you. And, and, you know, and I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm glad that you did that. I'm very glad of that. And, and second shock is, I agree with you. I mm-hmm. think this is a subject that ne- the, I think the only way we can resolve this issue is to actually stand up and talk about it, not on a national level, on an international level. It has to be done properly. We need to educate people. You know, I, I'm Pakistani Muslim, British, yep. Yep. born here in the UK, mm-hmm. lived here all my life, and I, I am. I'm I'm British, you know. Um, I don't. When people ask me, I don't say I'm Pakistani because I I wasn't born there. I didn't grow up there. This is my homeland. When I come back, when I go on holiday, when I come back here to the UK, this is where I feel content, where I'm home. All right. Good. So, I want to make it clear. First of all, it it comes down. To, you're saying, how do we change? What's happening? Well, well, well I'm saying, Kuram, I'm saying, how do we protect ourselves? Is, how do is, we protect yes, ourselves? Yes. The only way we protect ourselves is by discussing these issues, because as these these things are so random. When I say random, I don't mean that these people are not planning them. I mean that they're so random that we can't. Intelligent people can't cannot. And predict that it's going to happen. They might have someone as a suspect, but they can't predict when they're going to get into a car or rent a van or do something and do that. That can happen in a spare moment. This is unfortunately, and this brings tears to my eyes that there's only one way I feel to resolve these issues and protect ourselves, and that is by educating people mm-hmm. properly. You know, making them understand. Like, I hear people calling in onto this radio station all the time saying that, oh, the Quran says this and the Quran says that. Yeah. Yes, okay, the Quran does say this, but if you take a minute and try and understand Islam, Islam is not as literal. You can't take, it's not literal. If you actually study Islam, I went to Islamic boarding school. Never in my life was I taught. To um, uh, kill unbelievers. No, no, and, and Kurum actually, well. actually, Kurum, you know, a Christian could take something out of the Old Testament uh, that we'd find pretty shocking today as well. I mean, I understand all of those points. You know, you talked about the need on an international level for having an honest conversation about this. Let me ask you quickly: Did Donald Trump do that when he went to Riyadh and he said to fifty of the biggest world Muslim leaders, "Drive out of your places of worship those people." That wish the world harm. He did, and and I'm not Donald Trump is someone else. That I don't <laughs> no, well, I, no, 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 no. Listen, I'm, I'm actually Kerem. Right. I'm actually going. I'm actually going right. to actually gonna quit. I'm actually going to quit with you while I'm ahead because you've been nice to me. You've thought Trump might be right, and actually, it is time for the news. Kerem, a very interesting, great phone call there from Kerem in Slough. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC. It's seven thirty. If you're just joining us and haven't heard the news already in the last few hours, uh, a van has driven at approximately 60 miles an hour into a crowd of people in a very upmarket shopping district, Las Ramblas, of Barcelona. The latest we have is that 13 people have been killed and 50 have been injured, many of them seriously. We do not know the identity of the attacker. The most that we know is that one person was driving the van and that that person escaped from the scene. Whether or not They've subsequently been captured. Whether there are other people and accomplices involved, we simply don't know the answers to it. There has been a pattern over the course of the last couple of years where lorries, vans and cars have been used. Indeed, we saw it here in London just a few months ago. And I'm asking the basic question of what can we do to protect ourselves? Do we build a lot more walls on bridges and, 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 and on roads and around uh, areas where there are large numbers of pedestrians. Do we perhaps think to ourselves, well, perhaps I'll avoid visiting this big city? And on a bigger level, already callers have said, and including uh, we had a, a, a British-Pakistani Muslim caller from Slough, that there needs to be a more honest, open, international debate 
um, about the growth of terrorism and how we deal with it. But I'm not telling you what I think. I'm asking you what you think. And Sean from East Ham is my next caller. Sean, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Good evening. So, Sean, what can be done to make us a little bit safer? Well, I just want to stress one thing before I make my point, which I, your producer also stressed to me as well, that, as you've said, no one has been found out who it is yet. Yes, yes. But I think that the one strange remaining fact out of all of this is that seeming with all the terrorist attacks that have took place, there's the suspect who has committed the crime has always been known in some capacity to the security services of the country they've committed. Nearly always, yes. Nearly crime. always. I mean, of the London Bridge attackers, two of them were known, one of them wasn't actually, but, but, but generally, Sean, I would go with that point, yes. So I think, therefore, two key things need to be done to combat the problem, which is, firstly, we need better integration on the part of councils, local communities, and also on the part of the government. Do you mean, when you say integration, you mean knowledge sharing about who the bad yeah. guys potentially are? Yeah, so that, so that we're in a community where different ethnicities live, hmm. that they can feel safe that if they have a suspicion about their next door neighbour or the person across the road from them, that they have the sort of gall to uh, stand up and tell the relevant authorities. Sure, fine. OK. And by the, by the way, I just said bad guys. They could be bad girls as well, I guess. Um, and, and we have to gender balance this debate, of course. It's quite possible. But, Sean, fine. But, I mean, others would go a bit further than you, Sean. I mean, I've, you know, I've heard people... I mean, bear in mind, there are 3,000 people in this country on a suspect terrorist list. But in total, there are 20,000 people. Uh, and, and the rest of those have known links to people who have been involved with ISIS or ISIS sympathisers. There are some, Sean, who say, in the wake of all these attacks, and actually, you know, even including a former quite highly placed military officer uh, who led our forces for a bit in Afghanistan, that the 3,000 suspected terrorists should simply be rounded up. How would you respond to that? I think that would be completely the wrong way to go about it because I think that wouldn't help it at all. It would just fuel the fire more. I think it would just make more anti-Muslim sentiment than there already is in the country because I think that by him saying that, it wouldn't help the situation. It would just make it worse. OK, but you think there needs to be a lot more linkage between government at all levels yeah. as to who these people are, where they are and what they're doing. The trouble is, Sean, we simply don't have security services big enough, do we, to constantly no. track 3,000 people? But I also think the other thing that needs to be done is the horrendous scheme uh, that David Cameron thought was a good idea mm -hmm. to combat uh, this kind of terrorism, yeah. the prevent scheme. Yeah. Where he, he opened this scheme to sort of help radicalise, stop radicalising young uh, people from mm -hmm. going into these ideologies. But if you see the facts, it's just made it worse and hasn't made any effect at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think Prevent failed. I would agree with that. Sean, I thank you very much indeed. Uh, a point that gets made here that's been missed so far, and I thought somebody would say it, the other recent terror attack using a vehicle was, of course, in Charlottesville. USA. Um, a US problem as well as a European one. We have to work with the Americans too to find solutions, says Dan. Point very well made. And Cathy uh, makes the point uh, that I made earlier that the trouble is there are too many people on drugs these days and that needs addressing in a big way. Uh, we have too much lawlessness in this country. And, and she makes that point and it's a theme that I've returned to again and again on this show that nearly every time we see these attacks... In 90% in of cases, we find it is young men who've been radicalised, uh, you, you know, religiously, but they also are heavy, repetitive users of mind-altering drugs. And that's the pattern we've seen again and again and again. And a further point that our last caller made, nearly always too, they're on a known police list of some kind. I don't know whether... Barcelona will turn out to be the same way, but in, I have to say, somewhere in my heart, I'd be surprised if that wasn't the case. Um, Ali in Wimbledon, good evening. Hi, Nigel. What can we do, Ali? How do we make ourselves a bit safer? Well, the problem is that 
I think the, the current trend is that the people that are doing this have become self-radicalized. Uh, I think you will find the majority of the imams and the majority of the mosques and the majority of the Muslims in this country condemn this and reject these acts. However, you'll still find an individual mm-hmm. who has been self-radicalized over the Internet, over social media. Um, it's very easy to tap into ISIS messages and other messages. Radicalize yourself and believe that you can carry out uh, this type of action. It takes one person to cause complete carnage. So even though 99% of the people are rejecting it and condemning it, it mm-hmm. just takes one person uh, to carry out such an act who's being self-radicalized over the internet. And that's what you find with a lot of these guys. As you say, they're young, impressionable. They're hearing these messages, which are quite powerful on social media. Um, and one day they wake up and think, I'll just go ahead and do this. Um, because the other thing they're shown on the on social media and on YouTube and places, is the death and destruction of Muslims in the Middle East uh, through these uh, the wars that the West have, uh, you know, the invasions and the wars the West are involved in uh, in the Middle East, um, and that's the main message that's pushed to these guys: that look, your fellow Muslims are being butchered in yes. these countries, yes, and you yes, have yes. to carry out some sort of retribution. So it's not even that they're religiously indoctrinated. Um, and they're giving all the proofs and the Quranic verses for doing this. They're just shown simple images. And that's enough to radicalise these people to commit these acts. And it is likely, Ali, isn't it, that, that, that you know, you talk about self radicalization the kind of person who is more likely, I would have thought, to be self radicalized is somebody who perhaps didn't do very well in terms of education, who probably hasn't got a job, or perhaps not a very good job, or one they like. Uh, some, and somebody, and I'm going to say it again, somebody who is a repetitive, heavy user of drugs, and they are more likely to be self-radicalised. In fact, Trump, yeah, I, I, Tr- Trump called them losers, didn't he? He said the people, these terrorists, he called them losers. Um, so, I, you know, I can see, I can see what you're saying um, about self-radicalisation, and it's a point very well made. The only slightly the only thing, de- depressing thing, yeah. Ali, is how on earth, I mean, without controlling the internet, which clearly in a free society we're not going to want to do, um, what do we do about it? Well, it's extremely difficult. But I, I mean, I, I rang up and mentioned these points before. I think um, the so called Salafi Wahhabi scholars that are uh, they're marginalized by the government, they've been pushed to the side, um, and the government has pushed. Or, um, or promoted so-called liberal Muslims who have absolutely no credibility within the Muslim community, the likes of uh, Majid Nawaz and others, have zero credibility, which is why the government has cut their funding, has cut the funding of uh, organizations like Quilliam, because they're having no results in the Muslim community. The government needs to engage uh, the Salafi Wahhabi scholars who have some sort of influence over the people who are likely to carry out these acts. Yet the government has... They label these people as extremists and refuse to engage with them. And they are the people who can actually make a difference. And well, this is, this is, I right no, 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 that's a very interesting point. Um, and as far as Majid Nawaz is concerned, he, of course, um, is going to be uh, tomorrow uh, on LBC from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And Ali, ring him, talk to him. He certainly has some very strong views on this uh, and, and says things on the issues of radicalization uh, that are, uh, you know, pretty far out there. I mean, it takes, I think, quite a lot of guts to say what he says. Ali, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Uh, I, get a, I get a text from Dartford. I wonder if these people were known to the authorities, most probably. Yep, I agree. Whoever you are from Dartford, most probably. Uh, Matt in Seven Kings, good evening. Evening, Nigel. Pleasure to talk to you, mate. Pleasure to talk to you. So what do we do? I mean, the last caller... The last caller, Ali, yeah. actually made a really good point. He said there's a lot of self radicalization but barring shutting down the internet, I'm not sure what we do about that. Give us one idea, Matt, that can make us safer. Well, I mean, to be honest, the, the reason why I was ringing, Nigel, I was listening to a professor who Ian Dale was speaking to before, mm-hmm. and um, he was talking about, you know, how we must give more of our civil liberties away, our privacy laws away. And, um, you know, I, I, I just wonder sometimes that. These young men, Muslim men, who were going to these Middle Eastern countries and coming back battle-hardy. Our yep. intelligence services are allowing these, allowing these young battle-hardy men to come back into European countries, into our countries, knowing quite well that, you know, at some stage there's a very good chance that, you so, know, they're going to do something really bad. So, you know? so, so, stop, so stop them coming back, Matt, yeah? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but, I'm, I mean, the broader point that I'm getting to, I mean, what, you know, when we hear of these attacks... 
our politicians and, you know, your professors, like, you know, the professor who was speaking to with Ian Bale, saying that, we, you know, we must give more of our civil liberties away, more of our privacy laws away. You know, it seems very, very uh, Orwellian to me, like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. call me paranoid or... No, I don't. I think a lot of us feel like this. A lot of us are worried about our civil liberties. And actually, what we should be doing is using the basic tools available to us. Matt, I thank you very much indeed. And Matt makes the point about people coming back in. I have been screaming about this for years, that anybody that goes to fight for ISIS in Syria should not be let back in our country. And, you know, so far, we've managed to stop the grand total of one. That's right, one. And hundreds of others have come back and are living in our communities. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.46. If you're just tuning in, there has been a terrorist attack today in Barcelona in the Las Rambas shopping area, a very big touristy area. 13 people have been killed, 50 have been injured as a van at high speed, about 60 miles per hour, drove into a crowd. Uh, The driver got away on foot and we are debating what can be done to make us safer. I was making the point, there is a regular, we don't know the identity of this driver, but the point I'm making is there is a regular pattern to these attacks that applies in about 90% of cases. It is that the murderers are young males who have been religiously radicalised, are known to the authorities already and always have a drug problem. Lee on Facebook disagrees with me completely. He says people have taken all sorts of drugs over the years, but not all wanted to kill anyone. All right, Lee, fine, but you tell me why, matey. In this situation, there seems to be such a close linkage between the two. Maybe, maybe Ali, who phoned in and talked about self radicalization maybe it is people who are on drugs, out of work, living on benefit, with too much time on their hands, are spending too much time looking at bad stuff on the internet. Maybe, Lee, that's the distinction. I don't know. Um, I'm merely speculating. Um, on Twitter, I get practically to stay... The way to stay safe is to stay away from the bigger cities. It's difficult. It's too late. Well, um, Angelina on Twitter, we could all avoid the major cities, but in practical terms, uh, this is where people earn their money. Um, It's where they go to visit. Um, I don't see it really happening. The way to be safer is for the communities where these terrorists come from to be observant and to report them. And yes, that is something uh, that is being encouraged at every level. We need zero tolerance if the government knows of radicals and doesn't remove them from this country and these people then kill. The government is guilty of aiding and abetting, says Steve from Sutton. Well, Steve, there are 3,000 suspected terrorists living in this country now. There are, I think there's a growing body that thinks they should just be put in prison. I'm not saying I'm one of them, but it is an argument that's out there. Um, Katie from Twickenham. Good evening, Katie. Hi, Nigel. Um, just phoning in, um, maybe I was a bit like Lee with the uh, caller with the sharp intake of uh, breath, as you said about um, being a potential drug user. Yeah. But on a bit of reflection and, and sort of thinking about it, there may be something in that, and not necessarily in this case, but no. as someone who's done my prevent training and um, I work in an NHS environment, I think, you know, education is important. It's really important. And picking up on what Kareem said, and for the criticism of prevent, there are some really good messages in there for the public, I think, to be prepared. So... If I could elaborate a bit, you might be looking for, like you say, a vulnerable young man, social issues. One of the factors you might be looking at is, are they using drugs with an older male? Yeah. You know, and and those social issues. So so there is a potential there. Um, And I think that everybody can be vigilant and, and, you know, know what's going on in their communities and look out for multiple signs, really. How many people, Katie, how many people out there are trained in the PREVENT programme that Cameron brought in? Goodness knows. I wouldn't like to guess because I, 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 I wouldn't know the answer. I mean, is, it, is, is it a lot of people? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there probably are, especially within, you know, school settings, NHS settings. Yeah. Um, that training, you know, is mandatory. And I think it's useful. I OK, so, I, so, Katie, what you're saying is I've been a bit too critical of it, have I? No, not necessarily. I mean, I think we can, we can criticise some elements of it, but I think the message as well, even for the general public, on looking out for signs, you know, and raising flags to authorities is, is helpful. Okay. Because it's one of the only ways we can, you know, sort of help ourselves and prepare ourselves. 
Okay, Katie, no, I take the point and, 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 and I, yeah, I take it. Thank you. Um, I won't um, completely condemn prevent because uh, perhaps it helps a bit. I don't know. Um, now, we have Barbara Lucian is my next caller from Dollis Hill. Good evening. Hello, matey. How are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. So, <laughs> how are you going to make yourself safe? How are you going to make the world safer? Come on. Well, well, what I would do if I was in charge um, yeah. is, to begin with, I, I would address the herd of elephants that are in the room because what I think's really lacking here, and there are so many, there are meant to be so many intelligent, great minds leading all of these countries, particularly in the Western world. Well, I mean, what what I would do is actually address the real issues. Um, something my mum uh, said when I was a small boy and I was being raised, when she raised me, was prevention's always better than cure. Yep. And I really think that's what needs to be applied here because you, you, we can sit here and we can talk about, um, you know, building walls. We can talk about sat-nav. We can talk about all these crazy solutions, yeah? Let's get to the source of the problem. Let's, let's really look at why this is happening. And, again... Hindsight, I'm just going to flick through my points quickly because hindsight, yeah, it's a great teacher, but it, it, the way I see it, you know, the West are, uh, appear to be the pupils in the room that are naughty and they don't want to learn. And, you know, because they don't want to learn, they're being disruptive to all the other, class, the other pupils in the class. And when they're out in the playground, they're out bullying the other, the, other, the other pupils. That's, you know, on the macro level, that's how, how I actually see it. So what really I think needs to happen here is a spade needs to be called a spade. We need to put up our hands and say, you know what, um, okay, you know, especially like with a lot of ma many African countries, yeah, you know, we, a we actually need your resources, uh, you know, more than you realise, more than you need us, right? So we're going to give you a fair price. We're going to pay you properly for your resources. Um, you know, again, dealing with, with countries like West Africa. Right, so, 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 so just to be clear, the point you're making yeah. is, if we were fairer with the poorer third world countries, we would not have the mass migrations of people coming no, here. I, I'm not even saying that. That's part. I think that's a small part of the issue. The, the right. real crux of the matter, I think, here is, and, and again, like I was going to say, in terms of, of actually learning and hindsight, we had this issue back in the 70s with the IRA. You know, it didn't matter what we did. They got, they got round it. Mm. And you can't fight what you can't see. Therefore, you're going to have to eventually sit down like big men and have a conversation and deal with the matters at hand. Not, you know, going around bombing countries, stealing resources, and it's not, right. not doing uh, anything. OK, a different approach. I thank you, Barbalution from Dollars Hill, for that. And my last caller of this evening is Christine. Christine, good evening. Hello, uh, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you. Well, I'm actually calling, I think, in response to an earlier caller, I think he was called Ali, uh -huh. who suggested that a possible solution to uh, d uh, addressing the young people in this country is by uh, seeking out the Wahhabi scholars uh, for their wisdom uh, on this, because they quote-unquote, will understand these young people and can talk to them. It, you know, instead of... He spoke with, in derogatory terms about your colleague on the station, Majid, mm. who represents a view that if Islam is being dangerously... Uh, uh, you know, the problem in this country is Wahhabism has turned Islam more and more to a conservative view, which is totally in opposition to living within a Western country. Christine, they I'm going to stop to you there. They need to adapt. I'm going to stop you there, Christine, because you made that point so powerfully, and I have to tell you, I agree with it incredibly strongly. Thank you. We do not know who drove that van, but we've seen these patterns before. What can we do to make ourselves safer? Well, I have to say, and I'm going to go back to this, but Trump was elected on fighting ISIS and Islam and his speech in Riyadh about challenging the Muslim churches to drive out of their places of worship bad people was a good one. In this country, one little thing I would do, make sure every police officer is armed at least with a taser so when these horrible things happen, we can deal with it quickly. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back on the 28th of August, which is a bank holiday Monday. In the meantime, Ian Collins will be here from 10, but with continued coverage of the Barcelona attack, it's Clyde Bull. Nigel.